order hypothesis at 20. Can environmental regulation enhance innovation and competitiveness? Hello everyone, and welcome to week two of presentations. My name is Kevin, and today our group will be talking to you about the paper called The Porter Hypothesis at 20, Can Environmental Regulation Enhance Innovation and Competitiveness? This paper is based around the thoughts and ideas of a Harvard business professor named Michael Porter, and he states that well-designed regulations can enhance competition while improving the environment. It is necessary that we emphasize that these regulations are well-designed which also makes them quite difficult to generate. If profitable opportunities had existed to reduce pollution a long time ago, then firms would have already taken action to act accordingly. In our presentation, we will go over the Porter Hypothesis and its application in the real world today. We will discuss different articles and sources with conflicting views to give you more perspective on the topic. Next, we will talk about the direct effects and positive outcomes that setting regulations can have on business performance. First, regulations will induce companies to think about their use of resources and incentivize them to be more efficient, perhaps through new technological improvements. Secondly, regulations will require companies to reflect and gather data on their businesses, which may raise awareness on performance. As well, businesses can be hesitant to invest in ideas that benefit the environment because it might not be the most efficient. With regulations in place, there's less uncertainty that these kinds of investments will be valuable. To continue, setting new regulations that protect the environment will feel like a restriction or limitation to many companies. As a result, this creates pressure and motivates businesses to find better solutions that cope with the regulations while still making a profit. Finally, environmental regulations will be mandatory for all companies. Thus, this levels the playing field for the entire market. This improves efficiency in the economy overall by decreasing the amount of dead weight loss. To study the effects of the Porter Hypothesis empirically, we will look at the works of previous research and the results they show. Our first topic will compare regulations and innovation. Authors Jack and Palmer wrote a paper in 1997 where they studied the relationship between research and development expenditures and pollution reduction costs, and they found a positive link between the two variables. Several other studies support this correlation, and it is even suggested that the stability and flexibility of regulations have profound effects on innovation. On the other hand, a study completed by Nelson and his colleagues find conflicting views. Their research showed that air pollution regulations increased the age of American electric utilities in the 1970s, decreasing their value. Here's the graph that represents the study of Jack and Palmer in the previous slide. As you can see, an increase in pollution abatement costs is correlated with the increase in R&D expenditures located there on the vertical axis. We will now look at the relationship between regulations and business performances. Research completed by Gallus and Roberts in 1983 showed that a regulation on sulfur dioxide slowed down productivity growth in certain factories in the U.S. by 43% in the 70s. However, authors Berman and Bowie completed scientific research in areas of Los Angeles and their data revealed higher productivity in chemical refineries. The chemicals and processes that were placed under regulations can be seen in the table on this slide. And here we will look at the relationships between regulations and competition among countries. For this topic, most research is quick to imply that an increase in regulations will force businesses to leave their current locations and set up shops somewhere else. While there may be a correlation in this relationship, it is not necessarily causal. There are many factors that go into play when looking at why companies choose to go to another country. These include variables such as the wage rate, transportation, targeted customers, and many more. With all these factors at play, it is not with certainty that we can say that the primary reason why businesses choose to go elsewhere is due to pollution regulation. I will now pass it on to Lauren to talk about the design of the policy. The next section is about the designs of policies to enhance competitiveness. According to the Porter hypothesis, innovation and competitiveness are incredibly dependent on context with different implications for various different policy designs. Most importantly, it is essential that regulations be flexible and market-based and to recognize how policies beyond environmental regulations can impact the link between environmental regulation and innovation and competitiveness. The first types of policies that will be explored are environmental policies. According to Porter and Vanderlinder, 
For environmental standards to be to create innovation that offset costs, they must opportune maximum innovation by being market-based and flexible, continuously incentivize improvement, and be predictable at every stage. Market-based and flexible instruments, like emissions taxes and tradable allowances, are better for innovation than technological standards because they allow firms to find technological solutions to minimize compliance costs. For example, Bertrand's 2000 study of the U.S. in 1990 showed that switching from technological standards with emissions caps to allowance trading for sulfur dioxide reduced compliance costs from 40% to 140% lower than projected. While there was still net cost, the switch enhanced innovation and created organizational change and competition. Aside from meeting its primary goal of lowering emissions, which is detailed in the map. Another study by Isaacson in 2005 from 1990 to 1996 in Sweden demonstrated that a tax on nitrogen oxides resulted in a large emissions reduction at zero or very low cost. Continuously incentivized improvement is necessary because trading and performance standards seize the company's efforts once they've met government standards. Taxes, however, provide continuous incentives. For example, Anderson's 2000 study found that in seven EU countries in which environmental tax revenues are recycled into other tax cuts, there was a neutral or slightly bet positive net impact on GDP. And lastly, review of empirical evidence concludes that policies that are stable and predictable provide incentives to innovation, use suitable transition periods, focus on end results, are economic policy instruments, are more win-win compatible for reducing emissions and lowering compliance costs. The next policy designs are industrial and patent policies. Well-defined property rights for innovations will help to mitigate the research and development spillover, in which other firms benefit from the investment of one firm and which is a major reason some firms hesitate to invest in innovative uh, research and development. Further, mandatory licenses may promote technological adoptions, and subsidies and taxes for research and development may incentivize technological innovation for environmental compliance. Studies in the United States, Japan, and Germany have shown that increased environmental regulations lead to increases in patents of greener tech, which over time are adopted internationally. Training is important to help managers identify profitable but costly investment opportunities that they may not have pursued without the regulations. EnviroClub, the EnviroClub initiative in Canada is a great example of how this could work. Small and medium enterprises are able to improve profitability and competitiveness through better environmental performance because each firm completes one profitable pollution prevention project and attends workshops and receives consultancy services to help find where these regulations can benefit the firms. Analysis of the initiative has shown all projects to be profitable for the firms by reducing costs and pollution. And the tables here demonstrate how the program was profitable for governments, firms, and for society. Findings in Mexican studies also support this conclusion. Finally, environmental regulations can help firms overcome organizational inertia through revision of the organization of production and the business model. Organizational or government failures can limit managers' ability to pursue objectives or may allow them to distort incentives. Bertrand's 2000 study, for example, found that financial executives have more incentive to reduce pollution to increase the allowance that they could sell or reduce the amount that they would need to buy. Further, Arjali's and Ponsard's 2010 study found that this concept of the Porter hypothesis is dependent on the developmental stage of the firm. They propose the two-stage model that is pictured here. One of the main findings from the Porter hypothesis is that it is context-specific. 
We witnessed this in the example of U.S. paper mills, where more stringent air and water regulations significantly impacted the technology choice of paper mills. However, in this industry, regulation tends to divert investment from productivity and towards abatement, thus demonstrating that regulation does not lead to a competitive advantage in this context. Alternatively, productivity in the Mexican food processing industry was found to be increasing with more stringent environmental regulations, an outcome that is consistent with the Porter hypothesis. The article categorizes four major themes for research going forward. They are addressing data and methodological issues, exploring non-regulatory policy, utilizing longitudinal studies, and integrating global studies. Firstly, let's consider some data and methodological issues in the previous literature that this paper outlines. One of the challenges in empirically testing the Porter hypothesis is the necessary use of proxies for key variables of interest. In the study of environmental regulation's ability to increase innovation, innovation is often proxied by compliance costs incurred by firms. The issue here is that higher compliance costs are not necessarily a causal determinant of research and development. Furthermore, the Porter hypothesis is not claiming that higher abatement, abatement costs lead to innovation. Instead, the Porter hypothesis claims that regulation can funnel investment towards greener technology and that greener technology is often more productive due to waste reduction and other externalities. For example, perhaps a smaller firm would need to hire more workers in their compliance department as well as increase reporting. These costs are unlikely to yield an improvement in standard business operations, yet are a compliance cost nonetheless. The article further emphasizes that conflicting results may be attributed to observations being collected from various firms or industries. Different firms have different environmental characteristics, and some firms or industries are on the cusp of innovation investment required for technological advancement, under which the innovation pays off, productivity increases, or competitiveness is enhanced. The article further suggests that a meta-analysis of past research would help uncover the underlying effects at play. In addition to regulatory policy, there is evidence that non-regulatory policy may deliver the desired results of increased competitiveness. One example that was analyzed earlier was the creation of training programs that provide the knowledge of more productive approaches with environmental considerations to managers. The voluntary program 3350 was produced by the EPA in the late 1980s and 1990s with a legal goal to reduce environmental risks through voluntary action. Its namesake, 3350, specifies the goal of a 33% reduction in the pollution of 17 toxic chemicals by 1992, and a 50% reduction by 1995. The result of this program was a 34% reduction in the release of these 17 chemicals from 1988 to 1991, surpassing their initial goal, and achieved its goal of 50% reduction by 1994. Another recognizable non-regulatory program is that of Energy Star, which lowers the cost of production and offers incentives for consumers to choose products that are more energy efficient than competitors. It is likely that you have seen this sticker on various products in store. Firms are also motiv motivated by company image and corporate social responsibility. The Toxic Release Inventory reports the quantity of pollutants being released by various firms. Firms with the highest quantity of toxic chemicals released also experience the greatest loss in market value after the report was made public, suggesting that stock price and pollution are negatively correlated. The article proposes that further research into voluntary corporate reporting and what they call quasi-mandatory requirements from stock exchanges will improve these results. The article also outlines a potential lag structure at play and suggests that further longitudinal studies would shed light on these lags. They cite a Brunner Meyer and Cohen article from 2003 which finds a positive relationship between compliance costs and lagging productivity impact. Logically, this is consistent as innovations take time to develop, in addition to other timely constraints on firms such as budgetary cycles and building lives. Furthermore, culture is moving towards an emphasis on responsible corporate governance. Going forward, there may be an increased value placed upon environmental performance, which would increase access to capital. Another suggestion the authors make is that environmental protection is a global issue that will require analysis beyond national borders. Richer and more complete data will allow economists to focus on competitiveness across nations. Such analysis could provide insight on the three dominant schools of thought when it comes to environmental policy, which is command and control, performance-based, and market-based instruments. To briefly summarize, there are two versions of the Porter hypothesis. A weak version, which suggests that stricter regulation leads to more innovation and improved environmental performance and a strong version which implies stricter regulation also enhances business performance. Porter himself suggests that better protection for the environment could lead to a win-win solution for society. 
Our first question revolves around the idea of connecting regulations and innovation. In the paper, many different sources are used to put perspective on how setting environmental regulations can influence innovation for companies. For example, one study showed that after regulations were put in place, companies began to invest more in reducing pollution and emission levels. This led to an increase in R&D expenditure as well, which is evidence that businesses are inspired and motivated to change and innovate. Contrary to the study, another source confirmed that a negative relationship existed between innovation and investment in capital. So why might there be such differences between research of the same topic? What kind of businesses are more likely to have positive links, and which kinds will have negative ones? To start off the discussion, we would like to suggest that perhaps some businesses just require more innovation than others to stay afloat. These may include companies such as Apple, Samsung, Mercedes, and other tech-heavy industries. We leave the rest to you. The next question is how can initiatives like EnviroClub be applied to larger multinational firms? As a recap, EnviroClub is a Canadian initiative in which small and medium-sized firms take on one pollution prevention project that is meant to improve profitability and competitiveness via improved environmental performance. The firms attend workshops to identify low-hanging fruit, which are profitable but costly opportunities, and receive a set amount of consultancy services to identify how to leverage the regulations to the firm's benefit, particularly as it concerns the business model. The initiative has demonstrated to be highly successful and profitable for all involved, but how might we transfer this concept to larger firms who create more pollution? It may be beneficial to start thinking about this problem from a perspective of international economics and how additional pollution regulations, like emissions taxes or cap-and-trade programs, or even recycled tax revenues into other tax cuts, may impact international economic models. Perhaps we can utilize existing international economic organizations coordination initiatives to implement programs similar to EnviroClub for multinational firms.